Anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be here with you. And thank you to all of those who are joining us online. If Pastor Mike, you have gotten up this morning by this point, aloha to you, our lead pastor and his wife and, uh, and Mike's mother. She's turning 80 this year. And as a gift to her, they have uh, taken her to Hawaii, a, a lifelong dream of hers. So aloha to you guys. And uh, we, we hope that if you are joining us online, man, use that chat area, respond to things that are happening in the service. And, uh, and for all of you, Man, feel free to respond, maybe not as you would online, like, hey, what's that dirt on his face? Or like, hey, what was it? No, no, um, but, but please feel free to respond. And, and I would say even, even more so, man, get out a pen, grab some paper, uh, and you can, I, I will even give you permission. You can use those little welcome things in the back of the seat. God is going to speak to you today. We should come with a spirit of expectation, hearing from his word anytime his word is read, anytime that we have come together as the family of God, we expect to hear from him for our lives personally. So come with that expectation. Get out that pen and expect to know what God has for you for personal steps for your life based on what he's going to speak through his word today. Uh, the series that we've been in, it has, it has been awesome, and it is really the way that we are trying to start out this year is understanding God's love for us and our love for him and how we are to use those two things together to accomplish bringing his kingdom here on earth in our lives, having an impact in the world around us. One of my biggest takeaways from, from what Pastor Mike has been giving us over these past few weeks is how will I live or what will I do because of his great love for me and my love for him. This is monumental. When we begin to live our lives in this way, not just like, what will I do for God, but what will I do because of his love for me and because of my love for him, we will see radical transformation in our hearts and lives, and it will spill out into our communities, into our families, and the world around us. So I want to continue uh, to explore this a little bit today. I'm excited. We have all of our kids together with us. Today is Generation Sunday. Every fifth Sunday, we take some time to gather the entire campus together. It is important for our kids to see us in worship. It's important for our youth to see how this thing goes so that once they graduate and get out into uh, to other places, that they are used to seeing and being in a service like this. So thank you for worshiping. Thank you for entering in and demonstrating just how important uh, it is to continue in our faith. So I want to, uh, to, to continue to expand on this thing of God's love. And we're going to really camp out in 1 John and uh, chapter 3, verse 16, 17, and 18. I would like to read that for you now. It says, This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. Let's pray. Father God, for these next few moments as we are together, Lord, I pray that you would use me. Lord, I pray that you would use your word, that it would go very deep into our hearts. May it transform our minds. May we, may we be renewed in our thinking of how that we can engage your love and how we can engage those around us. God, I pray that there would be revelation for us today. Lord, I pray in these next moments that there would be something that, that just stirs, that you would plant seeds and those seeds would grow and bear fruit. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right, I have a little slide here, maybe, possibly. Yes, all right. So, um, and this is Mickey's Magnet. This is one of my very favorite books when I was growing up. Mickey is adorable, and his legs are super short, so I don't know how he gets around. But uh, Mickey, he loved his magnet. And the best thing about this book for me, twofold. One, it came with a free magnet. I was so stoked. Like, you, you open up the back, and there's this little sleeve, and there's a free magnet in the back, and I was like, that's awesome. And then the other thing man, I loved, Mickey would walk around the house and he would test different things to see if they were magnetic. And he would even take the magnetic field and make his pin magnetic and all this kind of stuff, right? So I loved doing that as well. I loved going around my house and testing different things to see whether or not they were magnetic. So the refrigerator, boom, oh, a magnetic. Now, the handle of the refrigerator, not magnetic. 
we had this big bag. We would, uh, one of my jobs as a kid was to take a sledgehammer and smash all the aluminum cans to, to be recycled. And so uh, I'd go out to the Pepsi cans, the Pepsi, Pepsi cans, that is, that is sacred. That is actually not Coke. There's no, I don't know Coke. Pepsi. This is, this is a real thing. So we take the, the Pepsi cans and try to see, no, not, not magnetic. The cat, also not magnetic. She didn't appreciate my experiments on her. However, found out she's not magnetic. And, and we do this in life. We test things. We test them to see what different qualities and characteristics they have to them. In high school, I, uh, I took chemistry. It was required. And I, I, I was not really, like, very good at all at math. And apparently there's math involved in chemistry. And so uh, as, as I remember, like, sitting in one of the classes, and they're talking about these different compounds and these elements and different things, and she puts up a, a slide of sugar. She's like, this is sugar. I'm like, that, that, is, that is nothing like sugar. They let her teach this class? There's no S. There's, like, CHs and, like, little things. I don't know. So I was already back and confused. Chemistry was my, not my thing. However, when we got to uh, the, the final exam, we were actually given a compound, and we had to perform a series of tests on this compound to see which elements were in there. And there were very specific things that you could do to test and see what characteristics of these different elements were in this compound. So throughout our lives, we see this in different areas, and it's no different in our Christian life. There are certain things that test and show us what characteristics we have in our Christian walk. A very specific way is love. Love. Love is the test for us as Christians to see whether or not we have Christ in us and whether or not we are living out Christ in our lives. In 1 John, and right, right above the passage that we just read, 1 John 3.14, it says, We know. So we know, we can have assurance. This is how we test. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. And this is not gray area. This isn't something where we can say, well, I don't know, it's a little, it's a little fuzzy here. I'm not quite clear. Where am I at if I don't love people? Can I still? No, it, it's very specific. The one who does not love remains in death. And we know that we have passed from death into life because of our love for our brothers. So this this is the very thing by which we test and approve our love and our devotion and and how how we are walking out our Christian faith and our Christian life. 1 John 3.16, it it begins to expand on this idea. And we have, the, the great thing is that we have this thing before us in Christ Jesus He didn't just set us adrift on the ocean of life and say, hey, good luck figuring this thing out. We now have a pattern of how we are to see what love is. This is what it says in 16. This is how we have come to know love. This is how we have come to know love. He, Jesus, laid down his life for us. The incarnation shows Jesus' love in action. This is an action that he performed to show and demonstrate his great love for us. He wasn't just kind of making plans and saying, gosh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if, and he had a specific plan of action and he took that step of action. And in many ways, as I've reflected on this, it's very easy for us, especially those who have grown up in the Christian world, even even those outside of, of Christianity know quite a few elements of the life of Christ, that he came as a baby, and that there's this thing called the cross. And, and really, as we reflect on that, this very vision of the cross and, and how he came, and it shows so much more than just that he died. Sometimes we look at this thing of he gave up his life for us, and we think of that, that, that m- moment where uh, he died, and that seems to be like the, the life that we're, we're exploring here. But he gave up so much more. I want to spend the next few moments really kind of um, digesting this and dissecting this a little bit of what that looked like for him to give up his life. And I, as I was thinking, too, about this, this thing of how familiar we are with this, um, and the greatness, the magnitude, I mean, even as we sang to get together today about this living hope that we have in Jesus, sometimes those, those things um, are so familiar that it, that it falls a little flat. Yet, like in our world, 
especially today, I would say, because of this very thing uh, around us where so many people are grumpy and kind of mad and there's just this, this general thing. Simple acts of kindness stand out. And I can even tell you, like, the number of times that um, someone's, like, just held the door for me. And, like, hours later, I'm like, man, that, that person was so nice. That was incredible. They opened the door. They held the door for me. Or, like, in our neighborhood, I don't know what it is. We're, we're the youngest family in our neighborhood by far. And uh, so I'll, like, be up at the top of the drive and I'm like, hey, someone's driving by. And if I get something more than a scowl, I'm like, yes, yes. And then if they wave, I'm like, wow. It is a good day. But like, here is the savior of the world who died for us. And I'm like, okay, he died. You know, and it, and it doesn't, it just, it sometimes doesn't have the impact. And so I really, I do want to have a little bit more of this understanding of what he gave, what it meant for him to give his life, what it meant for him to give his life for us so that we could live free. And he gave up heaven. He gave up heaven. It says that he is robed in majesty. Okay, so he's robed in majesty. And we, we have just a, a small fraction when we see even, I would say, with uh, like the coming coronation of, of the King of England and all the thing, the, the pomp and the circumstance that we see surrounding um, a monarchy, like we see a little glimpse of what that is to, to be majestic. But he is robed in majesty, King of kings, Lord of lords. And he comes as a baby. And he's wrapped in cloth and set in a manger. So... That is a a part of his life that he's giving up, being in heaven. It says that he's surrounded by angels. These these beings, these things that we see in in a number of places throughout Scripture, they don't know even how to describe them. People have had visions of angels. They have to use similes and metaphors. They're like, uh, it was was like this this ox with the face of a man, and like he had these wings, and it was covered in eyes, and, and there's these descriptions. Like, they can't even put words to the beings that are giving him glory, that are magnifying his name. They're saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Like he is in this, this, this system and this, this atmosphere of praise and adoration and worship. And then he comes to earth and he's ridiculed. He's spit at. He's set before Pilate, who is, who is, who is like a sort of a, like a, he's in the scheme of things, he's nothing. I mean, Jesus could have spoken at that moment and said, man, I made you. I formed you in your mother's womb. I knit you together. So don't don't tell me. (laughs) He could have done that, but he didn't. It said he was silent. He knew of his innocence, yet he knew because of the hope that was set before him, because he loved you and he loved me enough to set aside all of those rights, all of those things that he could have done in that moment, to call down angels, hordes and legions of angels, to, to take care of every single person who had given him uh, garbage and who had, who, had, who had beat him and who had ridiculed him. He set all of that aside. He laid down his life, all of his rights as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so that he could pave the way and demonstrate what true love, what true love actually was. He was guilty. He was charged as guilty even though he was innocent. His death was preferred by the people over an actual murderer. Like, and for him to stay silent in that moment is, like, it, it, it really boggles the mind. And then we come to the very, the very cross. And it's, it's such an incredible picture, not only because of, of the, the suffering that was endured, but this thing of In the Old Testament, it says that anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. And so now he, he, even though he was without sin, he is now taking the curse that was meant for us upon himself and suffering and dying in such a way that was humiliating, that was absolutely abhorrent and incredibly painful. So we don't, we don't have this picture like, I think that was an expectation and even um, as we as we look at the movies that we, uh, we 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 cheer at and that we hope for, like the hero and all this kind of stuff, like it's it's not it's not Thor coming on thunder and lightning and like rah, and we're like yeah come on, like that's 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 coming, 
That's the amazing thing. Like, there, there is a time when Jesus comes and, and he is the warrior king. That's spectacular, right? But at this moment, this thing where he comes and gives his life, man, on, on a cross, he doesn't die in some epic battle and he's like his last breath and he says something really quippy and people are like, yeah, I'll follow that guy. There's like silence after his death. They're like, what just happened? I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. But because, because he set before the foundation of the world, these things were set in motion. That he was able to have a plan. It wasn't, it wasn't some afterthought. Oh, gosh, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. These people are like out of their minds. They're sinning all the time. What, maybe we should do something. I'll, I'll go visit them. No, there was something set before the foundation of the world, before we had been created. His love for you and me was so deep and so abiding that he made a way, that he constructed this plan to make sure that we could know love, that we could follow in his footsteps, and we could have a right and true, real relationship with him for eternity. That's amazing. And it's something that I I really think we, we don't grasp enough and we don't think often enough on. In John 13, 35, it says, they will know we are Christians by our love. And in 1 John three sixteen, as we look uh, again at this, the next part of this verse, this is how we have come to know love, that he laid down his life for us. We should also, we should also lay down our lives for our brothers. This is, this is how we start to walk in his ways. He's calling us into this very thing. They will know we are Christians. Like we are to demonstrate as he demonstrated his incredible love to us through his death and for giving up his life. Man, we are to also do this thing. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but shuts off his compassion from him, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must not love in word or in speech, but in deed and in truth. I'm so glad. Like, here we have this incredible picture of his death, his giving up this life, this majesty, and all these things. And then, if he had just left it at that, we should also do this and lay down our lives for our brothers. I think there would be a lot of confusion, a lot of different ways. We're like, okay, so how do I give up my life? Like, what does that mean? Do I need to die on a cross? Like, what, what are those things? So then he quantifies it even more and gives us this very practical, this very real um, test and this application of how we can go about living our lives and laying them down for our brothers. If anyone has this world's goods, which we do, and sees his brother in need, but shuts off his compassion from him, how can God's love reside in him? I think this was really illustrated very well for me recently. There was a news story um, that uh, that came out from this this massive storm, this snowstorm that hit uh, the the East Coast. Uh, There was a guy named Jay Withy. And many of you may have read about this. It made national news. Uh, Incredible story. Because in the middle of the snowstorm, people are becoming stranded. People are trying to just get home from work. Um, In many cases, there were people who were unprepared. Uh, There was one story of a lady who had left her job uh, as as a nurse or a nurse assistant. She's only in scrubs. She had no warm blankets or anything. So when she got stranded in the snow on the side of the road, um, she, she, was, she was destitute. There was not much that she could do. So there's this guy, uh, Jay Withy, and he's on his way to actually help a friend out of the snow. The snow's coming down so fast that he continues to get stuck. He'll dig himself out. He just becomes stuck again. It gets to the point where he is, he is digging uh, as fast as he can, but it's snowing faster than he can dig. So he becomes stranded as well. Now, he begins to realize, like, this is, this is a bad situation for me. He's in a neighborhood. He's going door to door. And he's knocking on the door. And he's saying, look, uh, I'm stranded. My, my truck is stuck out here. This storm, everyone knows it's supposed to be super bad. Um, can I just come in and spend the night on your floor? First person says no. Close the door. He goes to the next house. He begins to offer $500 just to, just to stay on their floor. 
He says, I, all I want to do is I just want to come in. I just want to spend the night, and then I'll give you $500. No. This happens 10 times. 10 times. This guy goes from door to door, and people continually say, no, I'm sorry. They shut the door, and, and essentially, I mean, they seal his fate. The amazing part of this is that he sees on his phone that there's a school nearby, and he realizes, okay, they probably have heat, and there's, there's light, and there's a cafeteria. They might have some resources. He makes his way to the school, breaks in, and it's true. Like, he, he's able to get the, the heat on. He kind of surveys the scene, but that's not where he stops. He realizes, if I got stuck, I'm sure other people got stuck too. So instead of just taking care of himself, which I think at that point would be very easy to do, he goes back out into the snowstorm. And by the end of the night, he has rescued 20 people and put them in this shelter. This is such a picture of what it is to to love in action, to to love in in deeds, not just in word. Because I have a feeling that Every single one of those homes that had shut their doors, if you had asked them the week before as the storm's coming in, hey, if you could do something to save a life, would you do it? I doubt a single one of them would be like, oh, gosh, no. Why would I do that? They would answer, oh, yeah, I would save a life. If there was something you could tangibly do to rescue someone, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would definitely do that. But that's the difference between words and deeds. If we begin to do actions and have those actions as a part of our lives, there will be a much greater impact. And this guy, Jay, he could have been super ticked. He could come out of this experience, and man, I want to sue all those people. He, he got to a point, like, this is, and this is, this is that thing of, of turning a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. His, his heart after this thing was like, I'm so glad that no one opened their door. He said, because then what would have happened to those 20 people? Like that mindset, that thing of love that permeates our very being needs to be what is on display for the world. They need to be able to see it. They need to see our love in action, not with just our words that we say, hey man, we love, we love, oh, we love but then there's nothing that we've walked out in our day-to-day life that shows and approves and tests and reveals our characteristics and the characteristics of Jesus Christ. So what are we to do? I want to have some very practical steps for us because I think that's, that's one of those, those areas in life. I listen to some podcasts and people like, freak out and they rage about different things and you're like okay so what do I do there's nothing (laughs) so let's let's find some things to do shall we um stillness and solitude stillness and solitude this is a great place to start I want to I want to read you a couple of quotes from uh from A.W. Tozer modern civilization is so complex now he he wrote this in like the 40s and 50s and think like how much more so this applies now. Modern civilization is so complex as to make the devotional life all but impossible. It wears us out by multiplying distractions and beats us down by destroying our solitude, where otherwise we might drink and renew our strength before going out to face the world again. We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Take time for stillness and solitude. It is the incubator of God's love in our lives. One of the things that we must encounter is Jesus Christ. As a Christian, we must encounter our Savior, and he has made himself available to us. And when we sit, when we sit in stillness, in silence, and in solitude, we begin to open up that, that very thing of communication with him. How can he speak to us? How can we receive his love? How can we hear how precious we are to him? How can we hear about our identity? He is our maker. If we have no room in our minds for anything but the things of this world, 
So in stillness and in solitude, he can begin to download and impart to you, and I have made you for a purpose. I have given this special thing, this talent, this ability to you specifically for the purposes of my kingdom. This is how you use them. Stillness and solitude has such a major part to play in our lives as believers, and it is tough. It is so tough. I would, I would encourage you, there's, um, there's a few different apps out there now. I mean, so I'm, I'm like, <laughs> get rid of technology. Use technology. Okay, no. Uh, so there are some things within technology that can be helpful. Um, one of the things that I found, there's something called the Pause app, and um, it's, a, it's a Christian-based app, and it starts with just like a minute, and then it expands from there. And just in those periods of time of beginning to take a deep breath, specifically setting aside time, you will find that, that that hunger grows and that hunger deepens to spend silence and stillness and solitude, time with our Savior. So find those ways. Like put it on your calendar and hold to it. Do those very things. Take a prayer walk, like routinely. This is one way that our love for each other can grow. I heard this a while back um, in, uh, in another uh, from another church, and, and this, this, the preacher was talking about just this very thing of, of how it can. And, like, I've seen this now in my own life. As we're walking around our neighborhood, walking is this thing where you, like, get out and, like, you use your legs like this. It's kind of weird. Feels awkward at first, but you'll get used to it. Um, but as we walk our neighborhoods and as we're passing by homes, we're praying blessing over our neighbors. And we're beginning to say, God, would you, would you bless their business? God, would you bless their home? And sometimes we don't even know how to pray, but this is the cool thing about the, the Holy Spirit, man. He will direct and guide you. And then what's amazing is as we begin to encounter those neighbors and other things, we can then say, man, I, I, was, I was praying about that. I was praying that you would be blessed. And I was praying for the hard time that you're going through. And I, I know that God has his eye on you. We begin to open up those doors of conversation because we have already set our hearts and our minds on them being reconciled to Christ. We have been in that spot now, not, not, not caught off guard because like, oh, now we're talking about Jesus. I, I don't know. Like our hearts and, and, and our structure has already been set toward them. We've allowed the Holy Spirit to begin to, to bind us together so that we can speak directly to their hearts and their lives when we encounter them face to face. Take a prayer walk and get involved. Get involved. When we are around each other, when we are around other believers in Jesus Christ, this iron sharpens iron um, concept, the thing of us building one another up in love, and this happens. This is real. This is a tangible thing. So get involved. There are plenty of ways. What we have in the back, Pastor John talked about it, and we also have um, community groups. We believe absolutely in discipleship here. We are pushing um, toward a goal of not just knowing about Christ, but having a deep and intimate relationship with him that spills out into um, our community. Those community groups, how we, we uh, engage each other, there is an interest form. Um, Jory and some of our, our United leaders will be back there to give testimony to the amazing things that God has done through those United groups. And we have these learn environments Get involved, get in touch with these different places, engage yourself with other believers to build each other up in God's word, in love, and in truth. Our desire is not that these just become learn environments and then that's it, but there are specific tracks as a part of this to begin to share your faith and give you the boldness and the tools with which you can begin to, to share your faith more fully with others around you. Get involved there. We also have different serve opportunities. There's a banner right outside the double doors. And serve, serve begin, begin by just one Sunday, once a month. Right now, we have a, a good need for greeters. Our greeting team is a great entry point. Smile, shake hands, sanitize, repeat. It's great. It is awesome. It is, a, it is a great entry point. If you are willing to, to, to serve and put yourself in there, and it will build you up. It's a great spot. Scan the QR code. Put your information in. We would love to have you as a part of that team. Get involved. So with this today, and I do, I hope, 
And my prayer is that you will feel the Holy Spirit's prompting that as you go out through this week, take these things that you have heard and begin just those, those baby steps, those, those little things. Man, set aside a couple of moments each day. Begin to pray for your neighbors. Begin to pray for those around you. And reach out to someone. Reach out to another believer this week. Encourage them. And God will impress things upon your heart. Don't ignore that voice and reach out in love. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us a pattern, that you have given us um, encouragement through your word. Lord, that we can do these things. Lord, and that, that it, starts, it starts with a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that you would have such incredible um, just life for every single person who is in this room. And Lord, we know that you have said in your word that you have a plan for us, that you have, you have set things in your word, um, Lord, for each and every one of us. You know the, the hairs on our heads, God. We pray that as we go out through this week, Lord, that, that the things that you have begun in us, Lord, would grow, and Lord, that you would bring to completion all the things that you have, you have started this morning. We love you and we thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?